All right, good evening everyone. My name is Emily Luby and I serve as Special Assistant to Mayor Jones. Uh, the administration is so grateful to have you all this evening. We started the Cabinet and Community Initiative in November with the goal of making the Mayor's Office and your city government more accessible and transparent. Uh, I want to thank the team at Better Family Life, which includes uh, Deborah Ahmed, Tekka McDonald, Marion Williams Evans, Marla Dunbar, Darlene Henderson, Dwight Lassour, Tom Dully, and Mr. Daryl Grimes. Uh, they worked overtime this evening to get this space ready for you, and we're so grateful for them. And thank you to Alderwoman Boyd for joining us this evening as well. A couple of housekeeping things before we begin. Bathrooms are down the ramp to your right as well as water fountain. I recommend everyone take and have a community packet. Right here. Uh, Mayor Jones will mention different flyers throughout the evening and, and it can be really helpful to be able to reference what she's talking about. Comment cards are for people like myself who don't want to ask a question in front of 200 people. <laughs> so if you have um, something that you want to say or a question, someone in the mayor's office will answer it next week, either on email or by phone. Um, and then the last thing is that the Q&A period will be after Mayor Jones speaks. We'll form a single file line in front of that microphone over there, and you did not need to sign up in advance. Uh, please silence your cell phones, and I'd like to bring up Alderman Boyd for a quick welcome. Hello, everybody. How you all doing? I am so, so excited to see all of our residents in the 13th floor. So thank you so much for uh, weathering this storm because they told us it was going to stop, didn't it? But my husband said, if you want to believe something, don't believe the weatherman because he'll never know what's going on. So thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. And I'm honored that you all are here representing the 13th Ward. And make sure that you make sure your voices are heard. And all I ask is just be respectful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alderwoman Boyd. And I'd now like to call up Mr. Dale Grimes from Better Family Life. Good evening. Good evening. Oh, come on, you all can do better than that. We got the, the mayor out here. Good evening, everyone. My name is Daryl Grimes. I am the uh, Chief Executive Officer of Better Family Life. And we welcome you to Better Family Life's headquarter, our, our uh, cultural education business uh, center. And we are so pleased to be able to offer our facility uh, to the city of St. Louis, in particular to our mayor. Uh, we are here for you and uh, we, we, anything that we can do to make this a success, anything we can do to support our mayor, we're here for her. So I just want to thank everybody for coming out and uh, I'm not gonna take up any of your time. Thank you and hope we have a good meeting. And without further ado, Mayor Jones. Thank you, Emily. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. How's everybody doing? Good, good. Well, I um, want to first uh, thank you for weathering the storm and thank you for coming. I also want to acknowledge that Alderwoman Pam Boyd was here with us this evening. She had another meeting to run to, so we thank her for her presence. And we thank Better Family Life for opening up this beautiful space for us to have some dialogue about uh, what's going on in your city government. I also want to introduce the people who are brought with me today. Um, starting to my left, your right, uh, is Bethany Williams, who's the Director of Streets, Traffic, and Refuse. <laughs> Mr. Jankowski, who is our Commissioner of Forestry. <laughs> Jared Boyd, Chief of Staff. And now, skipping over the podium to my right, your left, Chief Robert Tracy, Police Chief. Will Pinckney, head of the Office of Violence Prevention. And Chief Charles Coyle, who is the head of public safety. 
So um, as Emily talked about, I'm sorry, there are also uh, cabinet members and staff in the audience. If you could raise your hand or just stand up and wave. I, I want you to see that we literally brought just about everybody we could to, uh, to this meeting today so we can be prepared to answer any questions you have. And also upstairs we have uh, tables uh, that have our city agencies, so you'll be able to get some questions answered afterwards as well. Um, as Emily talked about, we launched Cabinet and Community back in November of last year, and we have been crisscrossing the city. We started um, at the Herbert Hoover Boys and Girls Club, um, and in January we headed south to the Soulard neighborhood, to the Gene Slay Boys and Girls Club, and now I'm grateful to join you here in my neighborhood um, at Better Family Life. So as many of you know, I'm a daughter of Hamilton Heights, Wells Goodfellow in the West Side, and I grew up in this neighborhood. So my cousins and I used to ride our bikes up and down Page. I know that's very dangerous, but we did it anyway. Uh, without helmets, I might add. Um, and then also, I used to go to youth parties here at the YMCA. Back then, it was the Monsanto Y. Now it's the Bayer Y. Um, and just really enjoyed growing up in the neighborhood. My mother and her sisters had many homes around here, and so we would just hop between homes and have a, a good old time with our family. And those are the times that I miss about growing up in St. Louis. Um, I also want to extend a thank you to uh, Malik and Deborah Ahmed at Better Family Life who opened up this building for us. Um, so we're going to have a, uh, you're going to hear from me a little bit and then we're going to open it up for questions. But I don't know about you, but I am excited about St. Louis right now. This is a really exciting time to be here. My administration is committed to bringing people together to solve problems that impact you and create change that you can see and feel in your neighborhoods. We're putting in the work now so we can continue to create the stories that people love to share about our city. And you just heard me share a couple of stories that I love about St. Louis. Uh, last week, we introduced the, or I introduced the fiscal year 2025 budget. And budget season is one of my favorite times of year. I know it's like numbers, but I'm a nerd. So I love numbers and I love budget season. Because long before I became mayor, I majored in finance at Hampton University. And while working in investment banking and later as city treasurer, I managed a budget of millions of dollars, increased credit ratings, and oversaw hundreds of workers. And as mayor, I still do those same things, but now on a larger scale. Um, but also, I work collaboratively with Comptroller Darlene Green and the President of the Board of Aldermen, Megan Green, and the Board of Aldermen, um, and hopefully we will pass a budget with things that you care about. But the things that I care about that are in this budget, first off, we have fully funded the Office of Violence Prevention and the Bureau of Behavioral Health. We've allocated money for renovating our city pools, additional fencing and uh, air conditioning improvements at our rec centers, and dangerous tree removal. And last but certainly not least, we are continuing critical funding for our homeless services, for our unhoused, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, and summer youth programs. While we're taking a fiscally responsible approach this year, we are not cutting any essential funding. I repeat, while we are taking a fiscally responsible approach this year to our budget, we are not cutting any essential funding. But out of an abundance of caution, I announced a hiring freeze on all non-essential positions. The city is facing unprecedented threats to our earnings tax and our funding. The Board of Aldermen passed a fiscally irresponsible bill and overrode my veto. And politicians in Jeff City are attacking the city's earnings tax. And I'm talking about politicians who have never been to St. Louis for other than a Cardinals or a Blues game. You know who I'm talking about? 
those. And they're trying to tell us how to run our city. I think we know what's best for our city. Amen? Amen? I'm sorry, I always say amen. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a church girl, so I'm going to say amen. So the earnings tax is essential money that pays for our first responders, our street improvements, and other critical services. If we get rid of the earnings tax, that's a $300 million hit to our budget per year. And I want to note, if you applied for uh, a city position before March 29th, because we, we are in a hiring freeze, that hiring freeze does not impact you. We are still hiring essential personnel like first responders, trash, water, airport, and 911 operators. But if you apply to work for the city and you have questions about your application, you came to the right place because the Department of Personnel is upstairs right now and you can go up and go and ask them after we finish here this afternoon or this evening. Um, the American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA, is hard at work right here in the Hamilton Heights neighborhood and across our city. We have deployed ARPA money to have lasting transformative impact on our neighborhoods, year-round summer youth jobs for St. Louis children, metro bus passes for kids, our Nothing But Nets basketball league, to name a few, <laughs> direct assistance for small businesses and child care centers, Wi-Fi in parks. And so if you live in one of the following parks, you'll see we'll have free Wi-Fi in your park. And one of them is close to here at Ivory Perry or Gregory Carter Park, Loretta Hall, Murphy, Hall, Murphy Park, O'Fallon, Tillis, Amberg, Fox Park, and Gravoy Park will all have free Wi-Fi in the parks coming soon. <laughs> and if you want to know more about what we're doing with the, your ARPA dollars, they're not our ARPA dollars, they're your ARPA dollars, you can go to um, uh, at arpa.stlewis-mo.gov or look for the stronger STL signs uh, and billboards and window stickers across the city. We started the Economic Justice Action Plan um, just about a year ago and that is no longer a plan collecting dust on a shelf, it is in action. We have committed over Remember, we received about $500 million in ARPA funds, and we have committed over half of that to the Economic Justice Plan, and we're helping it to rebuild and invest in North St. Louis and parts of South St. Louis that haven't seen investment in decades. I talk about this commitment not only just in this neighborhood, but in every corner of our city. Our city cannot succeed if over half of it is left to fail. Again. Our city cannot succeed if over half of it is left to fail. We are planting seeds right now that will have an impact for many generations to come. I often say that we are planting seeds for tr and building and uh, planting trees that will give shade that we won't be able to see. We won't be we won't live to see the shade that that's under those trees. Um, we're doing a lot of work here in Hamilton Heights and the West End and Wells Goodfellow neighborhoods. Um, we're cleaning up neighborhoods and addressing dilapidated and uh, dilapidated properties and uh, ignored properties. We've spent, we're spending over $15 million to demolish over a thousand dilapidated LRA buildings. And we're spending about $13 million on stabilizing privately owned problem properties. So if you live next door to a property that is falling down and it is affecting your property, uh, LRA, I believe, is upstairs, and you can report that tonight, and we will try to uh, get that property on the list. We are trying to hold property owners accountable for holding property and not doing anything to it. So, so far in, in, in the wards that we're in tonight, we've used the program on nine buildings in the 12th ward and eight buildings in the 10th ward. And CDA and SLDC, or, or Community Development Administration and the St. Louis Development Corporation, um, have used funds on neighborhood beautification. We absolutely need to do a better job of maintaining city-owned properties and alleviating our communities of illegal dumping. We're also using funding, yes. 
We're also using funding uh, to fund SLACO to assist with approximately $480,000 for neighborhood cleanups. We're making investments in both for sale and rental properties. We have funded over 2,000 affordable housing units since I took office, including 65 units at Northside Heights and 88 units at Etzel Place. And we, know, we also know that many of our neighborhoods need single family homes. So we're spending over three and a half million dollars building 21 for sale homes on Cates and Cabinet just across Page. And I live on Cabinet, so I've seen some of those houses go up. What we're here to talk about the north side tonight, but we're going to talk about the south side. The south side's not neglected. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. We've learned that you just can't deal with buildings, but you also need to build vibrant neighborhoods. That's why we invest in organizations like Cornerstone, Slaco, and Delmar Main Streets to ensure that the community has a voice in that development. Um, we've installed new park equipment and renovations in Gwen Giles Park and a new community garden at the Bayer YMCA. And we've also made investments in neighborhood health centers like People's Health Centers right on Del Mar Boulevard where I spent a majority of my career. Um, we've helped uh, early childhood operational grants for several facilities in the 10th and 12th wards for uh, child care. And we've made numerous small uh, $5,000 business grants, and we'll be awarding those larger corridor grants in mid-May. But last but not least, we want to ensure that our elders or our seniors are not priced out of their neighborhoods So um, when, when the new people move in or when the neighborhoods start to improve. So we recently passed the senior property tax freeze, and more information about that program is also at our tables upstairs tonight. Um, and uh, we encourage you all to, if you are a senior living in your home, you own your home, please pick up that information. We have paper uh, applications for you, for you this evening as well. You can, apply, you can apply online, and our assessor is here. That goes through, the, through his office, Mike Dolphins in the back there. We're also changing the old narrative about when you find yourself on MLK Boulevard. Remember that old joke from Chris Rock? What do you do when you find yourself on MLK? Run. Well, we're trying to change that answer to stay. Uh, we're spending approximately a million dollars to stabilize privately owned commercial properties on MLK between Skinker and Union. We've recently acquired the old Killark Electrical Facility at uh, Martin Luther King and Vandeventer. Who remembers the old Killark plant? Well, soon that's going to become a hub for workforce development and the permanent home of the Office of Violence Prevention, LRA, and the Northside Economic Empowerment Center. When I tell you how excited I am to bring these resources and these services to our community, I can barely contain my excitement. As far as helping small businesses, when we opened the Northside Economic Empowerment Center at its current location at Sumner High School, um, we have served since opening uh, over 2,600 participants um, and uh, over 1,100 businesses, and over half of those businesses are owned by women. We've had over 140 technical assistance workshops, and more than 1,000 participants have, have attended these workshops. Um, and we aren't just investing money to get people to come to St. Louis. We want our community anchors not to get priced out of your neighborhood. So I talked about the senior property tax freeze, and we brought applications here. We, have, we, have, we are supporting community-driven redevelopment uh, plans that have prevented, or that prevents using eminent domain for residents that actually live in their homes. There's a bill that we just passed in the um, uh, uh, right north of, or in Old North St. Louis. Um, and the, we're providing tools to help you stay in your homes and get help with repairs. So you got the, health, the Healthy Home Repair Program. Um, that's $15 million in ARPA funds. And we, have, we are on pace to more than double the number of homes that we have repaired this year since last year. 
and we're creating pathways to build generational wealth through home ownership through the home STL program. Uh, you can get you can qualify for up to fifty thousand dollars in home buyer assistance through the home STL program. And uh, And in Hyde Park, we broke ground on the Be Well Farmers Market and Pavilion to provide healthy local food options. We are also preparing for summer. We know what happens when it gets warm in St. Louis. I don't even need to tell you, but we are preparing for summer. And it's the best time to be in St. Louis, honestly, because there are all sorts of things, besides the weather being all crazy, but there's all sorts of things to do, um, live music and parks and festivals. It showcases the best that our city has to offer. We've got Twilight Thursdays about to start at the Missouri History Museum, the St. Louis Place Whitaker Festival, or my personal favorite, the Muni Opera in Forest Park. Um, and uh, for those who use the Fairground Park Pool, we know it's been shut down for a while because we've had to make repairs. Well, it will be reopening Memorial Day weekend. <laughs> And if you are a parent or grandparent, aunt, uncle, or somebody that cares about young people, uh, Slate is here for you. Slate. They're a rowdy bunch. Uh, later this week, they'll host an open house for graduating seniors uh, that are graduating from our public schools. And we pulled together corporate, philanthropic, and nonprofit partners in one place to post, to, to post uh, job or graduation or post-graduation jobs for our babies because college isn't always the right fit for everybody. So if they're graduating and they're not going to college, send them a slate. We can give them a job. Um, also, the Department of Human Services has submitted their application to provide summer food assistance for families. So the list of those locations will be coming up soon. And following the tragic death um, Juneteenth weekend last night, which I saw as a cry for help from our babies, I pulled together our partners at the Mental Health Board, the Office of Violence Prevention, the Police Department, Parks and Rec, and our local young people to figure out what they need and what they want to do. And we have been slowly delivering on those promises. So our rec centers are, will be open again this summer, late, um, late on the weekends. Uh, we're trying to get four rec centers this summer. I don't know if we'll actually get there, but we'll at least have two. Um, we'll have bonfires and late night basketball leagues um, and so much more. We want them to have a space to have, be safe and have fun and be kids. And speaking of what we did last summer, I believe it directly led to our decrease in youth violence. Our juvenile shootings were down 47% and our youth victims of gun violence is down 50% from last year. We are also hiring utility workers. Um, and speaking of hiring, you no longer need to be a city resident to work for the city. You no longer need to be a city resident to work for the city. You no longer need to be a city resident to work for the city. We've hired over 50 utility workers to maintain our parks and LRA lots and stay on schedule with grass cutting. Uh, Mr. Jankowski knows that I will even sometimes put on my forestry shirt and get out there on a mower and cut some parks myself. I am not above doing that. Um, and we'll have the exact same cooling, cooling centers as last year to support our unhoused neighbors when the temperature gets really, really high. And that, those will be also posted on the city's website. Um, we came up Page when we came from downtown. And I know that Page is, one of, is a major thoroughfare through our city. But how many of you know that Page is not a city-owned street? It's owned by MoDOT. It's owned by MoDOT. And so MoDOT completed their safety audit recently of Page Boulevard. Um, and their designer is, has been hired to design the streets, potentially doing a street diet, like maybe how you see on Natural Bridge. And work on Page Boulevard will begin in 2026. So I wanted to report that to you. So it's coming down the pipeline. Just need you to be patient. 
And we have allocated over $40 million in American Rescue Plan Act funds for major thoroughfares and our top 10 crash intersections. Um, so three of those are near where we are tonight, Kings Highway in Del Mar, Kings Highway in Lindell, and Lindell and Whittier. Uh, we will also be uh, repaving our major thoroughfares like Union, Kings Highway, Goodfellow, Brand. So the Board of Public Services here, stand up, Rich Bradley. Show the people who you are. So we're planning a series of open houses this summer to show you all the proposed designs and ask for your input because that's a part of the process. The whole process from the time that the money is allocated to the time that the work is completed can be over 800 days. Do you hear me? Because we want to do it right and we have to follow certain steps in order to do that. So the next step is the open houses this summer to show you the proposed designs and get your input. Um, the, the engineers are working incredibly hard to finish the designs to, this month to allow construction to begin this fall on those major thoroughfares. Um, so what else? We, we also will begin, we'll be starting some residential paving this spring and summer. Um, so look, uh, look in your wards for that. And if there's a street that you think needs to be repaved in your ward, call your alderman. Your alderman is the person who's responsible for providing funds to the streets department or BPS to then get those streets paved. Okay, so if there's a, a particular street in your ward, it starts with your alder person. Uh, and speaking of traffic safety, um, I want y'all to pray for me because my son just got his driver's license. <laughs> Uh, and, and he is eager to drive, and the last sort of bit of leverage that I have over him is like, you can't drive my car if you don't have a B average. So he's, he's working feverishly to get that B average up, and I, I'm, I'm hopeful that he can, but I'm secretly praying that he doesn't. <laughs> Y'all don't tell him that. <laughs> um, on public safety, I know that that's an issue that's near and dear to everybody's heart. Um, we are putting the public back in public safety and making you safer in the process. Um, we uh, follow three tenets of public safety, prevention, intervention, and enforcement. And it's a holistic approach that brings everybody to the table. So and, uh, to give you an example, a recent call came in from a client uh, into 911 who, who asked for EMS because uh, they were having suicidal thoughts. Uh, when our crisis response unit arrived, which is our op an officer and a behavioral health professional, they didn't want to talk about their crisis and they wanted to go directly to the hospital. They did everything they could to gain that client's trust and demonstrate their desire to help. Soon after, they became at ease and our team was able to develop a safety plan and set up an appointment for that person to see a behavioral health provider the next day and save her life. I tell you that story because these are the kind of partnerships that we are employing in order to keep everybody safe. It's not just police officers, it's not just firefighters, it's not just EMS, it's also behavioral health professionals and trusted messengers and people who have had actual experience actually all working together to keep everybody safe. Um, also, we raise wages for our 911 dispatchers and we're building a state-of-the-art 911 facility So the national standard is that more than 90% of calls should be answered in the first 10 seconds. This time last year, St. Louis was at 50%. Well, I'm proud to report that we are hovering around 80% of our calls answering the first 10 seconds. Again, we have fully funded the Office of Violence Prevention, um, which funds over 30 community organizations that prevent and interrupt violence and we're bringing people together to make you safer. 
We launched a regional violence reduction strategy with surrounding counties everywhere from O'Fallon, Illinois to O'Fallon, Missouri, because crime doesn't stop at our borders and neither should our solutions and interventions. We are committed to reducing homicides by 20% over the next three years using um, focused deterrence, cognitive behavioral therapy, and trusted messengers. And that process starts next week. And we're fighting like hell to maintain control of our police department. See, again, those outstate legislators who don't know jack about St. Louis want to tell us how we should run our police department. And I think the person who knows how to run the police department is right here, not them. Since Chief Tracy has been hired, he has attended over 150 community meetings just in his first year. And if we want to talk about what a state takeover of our police department can, can do to our city, just look at Kansas City. Now, this is no dig against my brother, Mayor Quentin Lucas. I, he knows I love him and he loves me. But the Kansas City Police Department is controlled by the state. And last year, they had more murders than us. This year still, they have more murders than us. Now, every life lost to gun violence is one too many, but how can the chief having five bosses instead of one make us safer? The math ain't mathing. It's not. So if you want some homework, Call your state representatives and your state centers and tell them to fight like hell to keep our police department under local control. So in closing, it's an exciting time to be here in St. Louis. I don't know about you, but I feel the excitement in the air. I feel like we are turning a corner and we are committed to bringing people together to solve problems that impact you, each and every one of you. We're putting in the work now so we can continue to create the stories that people love to share about our city. Everywhere I go that, I, that somebody finds out that I'm from St. Louis or I'm the mayor of St. Louis, they all have a wonderful story to tell about family that used to live here, visits that they've made here, um, or they used to live here themselves and have moved away. All roads go through St. Louis. All roads go through St. Louis. And it's up to us to make sure that we provide, that we are telling our own story about the great things that happen in this city. Because St. Louis is like somebody's cousin or uncle. He's a new, you don't want anybody else to talk about your family, but you're going to talk about them, right? <laughs> but when you do talk about them, I want you to tell positive stories. Because what we speak into existence becomes a part of our reality. And we don't want that reality being that St. Louis is some, uh, you know, uh, crazy city, right? Or St. Louis is old, or St. Louis is just on its way down. St. Louis is on its way up, isn't it? I don't know about you, but St. Louis is on its way up. So thank you again for joining us this evening. And um, thank you all for spending a little bit of your evening with us. And uh, God bless all of you, and I'll open it up to any questions you have. Thank you. And please introduce yourself with your name, your address, or your neighborhood. Thank you so much. Good evening. I'm a resident of Hamilton Heights. <laughs> So my question is brief. Um, how do we, black residents of what you're calling of St. Louis, reconcile the need for safety, the need for racial equity? While we cannot incarcerate our way out of our crime or epidemic, there must be justice and accountability for those who choose to continuously wreak havoc upon our citizens. Um, my name is uh, so I think it starts with, well, not I think, I know it starts with collaboration in community. It starts with going into communities and engaging people. Uh, accountability can happen in many ways. Uh, so first it's, all, it's also about understanding the harm and the trauma in communities. 
uh, it's understanding that there's multiple voices in community. So when I think about the Office of Violence Prevention and what we do when we think about funding organizations, we fund organizations that look at restorative justice practices, right? And they look at people who do harm and people who are harmed and potentially bringing them together to reconcile. But we also have, um, we also fund organizations that look at trauma, right? And trying to help people deal with, maybe they were shot and they impacted by a bullet, right? Or maybe they weren't impacted or directly penetrated by a bullet, but they were impacted in an emotional way, in a mental way. And we want to address that issue there. That has nothing to do with people being held accountable for the harms that they do. Uh, our focus is on violence prevention and intervention, working in communities, showing up in communities and making sure people are aware of um, resources that are available to them to get help. Because, you know, I, I was asked a question not too long ago about weapons and guns in communities, right? My job is not to focus on whether those laws change, but focus on how we exist in the context of what laws exist. Uh, that has nothing to do with what uh, the chief and the great job that they're doing happens. They're going to handle that uh, accountability that's meant to um, deal with people who've done harm and charges can be brought if there are charges that can be brought against someone. But we have to deal with what is left even in the aftermath because nobody wins in a shooting or homicide. There's no good outcome. People are impacted that aren't even directly related to that that incident between those two people. So it starts with being in community, it starts with listening to community, it starts with making sure there's multiple types of resources that are available, but we need to start conversations in community, which are happening. I see someone right in front for our car. We have a public safety collaborative that we fund. There are people who live in community coming together to decide how they can best address the harm and the challenges in those communities. Yeah, when you take a look at the community and, and you talked about the balance of holding people accountable and then you talk about prevention and intervention, uh, I, I'm big with focus deterrence, trying to give people a chance out of crime that have gotten into it. And then when I look at the communities, and, and I got uh, Major uh, Donnell Moore who's here, he's standing in the back, just raise your hand, Donnell. So I count on Donnell, one of my majors that oversees, he used to have the 6th District, now he oversees the 5th and 6th District. And the strategy we put in place is to make sure there's a balance of over-policing or under-policing a community. And how you get there, uh, when you look at the people with the highest propensity for violence, it's a very, very small amount of people that are committing most of the crimes. So what we've done in policing, and, and it's been done, and I don't agree with, and we've changed a lot of our strategies, is that we would flood the community with hundreds of police officers. We would arrest everyone regardless of just the lowest level crime, we would bring crime down, but we would actually lose the trust in the community because we're not working with the community. We're arresting everyone to get the few that are causing the problems. We know who they are, but we're trying to work with them first, to give them options through officer violence prevention, focused deterrence, trying to work with some of the root causes before they get there. But if they're gonna to continue to cause that harm in the community, uh, our officers, we're gonna hold them accountable because that's what the community is asking us to do. And we go to every community meeting and uh, making sure that we go to one throughout the city. My major's there, my commander's there, my officers are there, because the only way we're going to be able to reduce crime without local policing is to be working together, hearing the concerns, going to the areas people are asking us to go to. And I think those are the things that I think are working. And, you know, it's a short term. We've only been doing this uh, a little over a year. But we saw some very good progress in our first year with a 20% reduction, over 20% reduction in homicides, lowest in 10 years. We want to build off that because, as the mayor said, one life loss is too many, and I agree. Uh, we're even with last year, we're still below from years past. And I think we got to build off that, but I think it's going to take a little time. It's going to take trust. And I think this type of policing uh, goes a long way, and I think that's where you get the balance of the question that you just talked about. Thanks, Chief. Yes, ma'am. Well, okay, my name is Robin Mew. I've been 58, 33 Plymouth. Been living there for 31 years. And those are some place apartments. Everybody want to brag about. They let people go up in those apartments, but those apartments are empty. And they live up in there and they create problems. And when you go to them, they don't do anything about it. You understand? And 
there. I mean, really there. I retired. I've been retired since 2002. I'm 54 years old. But boy, there, right? That's how we come. And just saying, we need to help people up, up in there right now. This should not be there. They should put more cameras and lights, you know. People with God seen AK 47 three times from the apartment people. And I let them know I see them, you know, but that's okay. Everybody needs to take it. But that's all I'm saying. They say one thing and they do something else. And they got trash all on Plymouth and Edsel. No, they don't do what they're supposed to do. Because if they did, I wouldn't be here. Yes, ma'am, we will know that uh, and, and uh, take a closer look there. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Next. Hello, everyone. My name is Mary Ann Jackson, and I live in the north side. I live in 5641 uh, Summit Place. I've been here in St. Louis all my life. And um, my, my concern is really deep. Well, first of all, I want to give St. Louis Forestry and uh, the port a praise for what they do and not do. They do all the job. I know they need more people to come and, you know, and get hired, but what they have, I, I thank you for that. But my really concern is this nuisance. I'm with this lady here with this nuisance. How is we going to ever get our community together? When we have drug activity, it's causing problems with people that own their problem, living, moving into their mother home, and they people is trying to run them out of there because they want to be right and want to get rid of the problem. And, I, and then, not only that, when they call the police, I mean, it's like everything's over with. You know, what what is it going to take for us to get better service in this community service from our police department and from the other division of the city of the building inspector and all the others. So for starters, again, as we are constantly hiring. Um, and even though we have a hiring freeze, we're still hiring for essential workers. And a lot of times, you know, the, the job market has changed. Uh, a lot of times people don't want to come and work for the city. They don't want to do these jobs. Um, and we, we've tried to increase pay. For example, for our, um, our uh, CDLs, for our, our uh, trash truck drivers, at one point we had a $3,000 hiring bonus for new drivers. And we got very few applications. Nobody, not saying nobody, but again, it's very difficult. Uh, this is a difficult labor market. A lot of people want to work from home yeah. um, and, and want to do remote work. Um, that's. You can't be a remote worker and, and cut grass in the city. Those two just don't, don't, they don't work. Um, but we're doing whatever we can to try to bring more people in the door. We hired a new, the, the Department of Personnel is here today, Sonia Gray. It, it also used to be, it took a long time to get a job for, with the city. It took, we wouldn't call you back for months. But under Sonia's leadership, we, are, we have computerized our hiring department. Um, and we're going to be launching new uh, software in the, in the coming months. So you'll be able to track your progress when you apply for a job. You'll be able to track your progress through the, through the uh, hiring process. Um, and also, we're hiring more officers. I think we have our largest class of uh, recruits going in um, at 28. 25, that number seems to get far smaller and smaller, but 25. And we're doing that hiring on a rotating basis. So instead of just waiting until we fill the class and then starting the class, we are, we're doing that hiring and that starting those classes on a rotating basis so we will have classes graduating about every three, two to three months. Um, so we're doing everything we can to fill those positions and also realizing that uh, we're, we're taking a look at the data, right? We're taking a look at how long it takes to answer your questions when you call us uh, with CSB and let us know that a tree is down. We will track that data to see how long it took us to respond and have conversations with forestry, with parks, with all of the departments to make sure we're delivering services in a more efficient and equitable manner. So we're hard at work. 
we're hard at work to try to fix it. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Jones. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mary Hennings. I have quite a few concerns, but I'm going to just try to address them properly. One is the violence in the neighborhood. I live on Cup Grade of Wellington. And all I'm hearing is gunshots. And I was wondering if, in fact, if you do get more police officers to work, will they walk with me like they used to back in the day or just cruise through the neighborhoods to see what's going on in the neighborhoods? Because I'm constantly hearing gunshots. I lost both my sons through murder. Five months before I lost my youngest son, I was shot. So that's why I'm in this position. Right now, I can't even, I was a barber and a beautician, I can't do that anymore because of the gun violence out here in the streets and I was randomly shot, didn't bother anybody. And I know it's a lot going on. I'm thankful that you're doing something for the children in the community, opening up the centers to give them a place to go. It's, and I'm thinking about examples, these lots. Last year, they cut a lot. Once that year, I called constantly, constantly till the end of the year, they finally went on and cut it. I'm saying rats, you know, rats will hibernate in tall grass. I'm cleaning out my back porch, getting it ready. Hopefully, I can get Mission St. Louis to help me with uh, my home. I'm cleaning out the back porch. Uh, it had to come from this lot. A big dead rat, thank God. It was dead. It had me shaking. I swept it off the back porch into the yard. But I'm concerned about all of these things and more. Like my neighbor's house looks like it's about to fall down in my yard. And these things I've called the city about. I've really got no response. But I have a lot of listening to what's going on and I don't know what to do other than to let you walk now. So um, can we have a conversation afterwards? I I've known you for a long time and, and I, I hate to hear that you're going through that. So let's have a conversation afterwards so we can address your issues directly, okay? And what he was talking about when you get shot and the PTSD and all of that, I haven't had any place to go to address other than the grief meetings from the parents, other parents, and that helps me to deal with a lot of things because I'm amongst those parents that lost their children through gun violence. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. How are you doing, Mr. Good. Uh, good. We also, Attorney Christie. And uh, the bigger part of North St. Louis, where we live now, my dad's 92 years old, like your dad. And uh, that shooting that went on yesterday from Taylor between Ashland and Elm Bank, we made, I don't, can't begin to tell you, at least 10 calls on the <clears throat> poor family flat where a lot of those young men were hanging out. I'd love to walk you over there after this meeting and show it to you. And along with that, Ashland, Taylor, Elmay, New Shed, we have people who just park cars randomly and leave them there. And we call and ask the city downtown, City Hall number 215, asking them to come and look at this, take the pictures down there. But when you call, they put you on hold and they never come back. So I went down there because I worked for the city of Baltimore at the time. And still no reaction. We can show you and tell you where all this stuff is happening, but you gotta come to the rescue. And like the young lady just said before, you know, he only had six or eight policemen working in that area at the time. I know it's gonna be hard. But trust me, we want to tell you and yell at you, but you gotta help us so when we get a vision. And we're gonna get some wall right now because the bad guys know that there's not going to be a lot of reaction on the part of the city. Right? And so we have to, have to come. And uh, the other part of that is you're looking for 
uh, individuals who want to help and work in the city. I work with an organization called Urban K-Life. And uh, we have those kids. We're in every major public school, Southern, Oman, Bekshan, Career Academy. And we're working with these young boys and young girls, and they're ready to take on these jobs. A lot of them won't be able to make it to college, but they're ready to come work with the city. We invite you guys down and be a part of that. Golf tournaments, we have all kind of job festivals. So we have the resources, but we definitely have the need. And my dad is 92 years old, been a part of most holy grocery church, saying the word. As all that has gone downhill, he still hangs over that corner, and I help him. And this is no accident. As I was cutting the grass, I saw those boys who had those AK 47s run right by me last night. And all I could do was pray. Because I didn't believe that another call would get somebody over to that neighborhood. So, our hands are tied. And we'd love for you to visit with us. Sir, thank you for those comments. And, and uh, lady, earlier, I'm sorry that you got shot and that you've gone through the gun violence. Uh, the trauma that you've gone through and what everybody goes through. Will Pickney talked about, that's real, PTSD, what the community goes through. Everyone that's shot, gunfire, or homicide, it affects everybody in the community. It actually affects the whole city. And there's studies on how it really could bring the city down if we can reduce those things. But it, it's... It's a several pronged approach, or three pronged approach. First, reasonable gun laws, as far as who can carry guns and, and carry them in our city. And we're up against that. It's something that I'm always I'm going to be down in Jefferson City tomorrow, uh, testifying against state control. So we're going to be going, but I actually have a conversation with our elected officials about reasonable gun laws that can help keep our community safe. That's number one. When it comes to the shots fired, one of the things that we do have and uh, the lady asked about having foot posts. Well, we, there's not a police department that has the luxury where we used to be in the United States, having a foot post on every corner. Central West End has additional resources because of something else. But we'll, we're actually, we take a look at how we can do this. But here's, here's one of the things that you, coming in the United States, 911 calls take priority. And we have to make sure that we're answering those calls for service. And when we do those, we have to make sure that we're answering in a timely manner when you make that phone call. What we're trying to do is take calls out of the queue. The mayor talked about having other people handle jobs instead of the police. And that could give us more time to deal with more priority calls. That's number two. Number three, I talked about having major more here. I talked about the opportunity now coming out of the pandemic. I've talked at community meetings, coming out of things where we can get back to policing and try to get back to where we used to be, where we're having those conversations and building that trust. So you do have that phone number to call when you see not only 911, but we're getting ahead of it at community meetings. Who's carrying the guns? Who's parking the cars there? Who's having the narcotics operations where it can send drug in, in, uh, investigation teams in, we can work out a plan on some of those things with our major and our commanders, but we have to get in the room, and that's what I'm trying to do is make as many community meetings as possible, build that relationship so it's not just about a 911 call. And then when it comes to shots fired, one of the biggest things that we need to leverage, and a lot of cities have it and haven't leveraged it, is shots fired. Shots fired gets us to the scene very, very quickly to an area where if you hear a shot fired in an area, you, can, you don't know exactly where it is unless someone's hit. But we can get close into the seat where we can render first aid, that happens all the time, because we're the first on the scene. But we also, what we have to continue to do, and I press on our police departments, pick up those shell cases. Those shell cases, when we correlate them, help us identify who the trigger pullers are, and help us solve homicides and shooters and make better cases so we can get some of the people that haven't taken some of the resources that are still causing harm in our community. And those are the things that we're gonna to continue to do, try to get better at, and then try to get back up to budgeted strength. We have, show, we have slowed attrition down 
and we're making sure that we're going to try to build this police force back up to what its budgeted strength used to be after a lot of people left in the last few years. But we're not the only industry that have seen that, but we're going to get that, we're going to get that back up, and I see a lot of people coming back into this profession to make sure that we can do the job that everybody's expecting us to. But in the meantime, I think these community meetings, leveraging technology, listening, having those calls, Major, Major Moore is listening in the back. He will be taking information down. Ma'am, you talked about your incident and what was going on. I'd like to hear more about that so we can work together with my commander and my major on some of the issues that you're experiencing too. We're hearing you, we will take those addresses down and it might not just be about policing, but we can help coordinate with the other city services, with the mayor's office and the rest of the team that I'm part of. So that's that's some of the promises that we're looking to do in the community. Hold on one second. Thank you so much, Chief Tracy. We'll move on to Major next. Major Moore, can you raise your hand and make sure that you connect with this gentleman? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. When I'm strictly on the north side of Princeton. I come up on Good Poland and uh, Vernon. We're the first students to be bused from Doja to sneak through Forest Park. Let me say something in regard to the state taking over our department. Right now, we've got an incident where there's a young man missing, 19 years old. He's a resident in the city of St. Louis, but he's been missing now for three months. Now, Kansas City, Missouri House State patrol officers have they have an attempt to help this grandmother find her grandson, college student. He lives here in St. Louis. Hell no, we don't want the state to take over our work. That's great. I met Chief Tracy. I didn't meet him, but the first three to come up on that stage, I was there. Let me say this. My concern is all these deaths that's in the Justice Center, but I'm more concerned about the deaths that's in these penitentiaries. I had to go to Charleston's Correctional Center. My son was in a coma. They told me he was dead. I say, damn lie. I got up. I spent the day, the night, all night, sleeping in the car. I met Mr. Bill Stang, the warden of the Correctional Centers of Missouri. We need someone to say, go in that justice center, chastise those guards. Don't can't get up in there unless they bring it. I can't get signatures down there because they're not city St. Louis residents. Most of them live in Illinois. I watch a lot of things happen in that justice center. I say this again. Before I come down with colon cancer, I'll be locked up twice every year. So I can tell you what's happening in the Justice Center. You got people that go in there, maybe about the Hillsdale Pine Lawn. If those people can't get a bond, they sit three or four weeks. I have to create a riot to make them come there and get some act right. We want some act right. Police are neighborhoods. And we need some residential policing in our neighborhood, because I don't see them. I'm out here every day. 45 years as a civil activist. They don't call me Joe Perk for nothing. Mayor Jones, do you want to address the question about CJC and improvements we made at the city jail? I'm going to ask Chief Coyle to address that. Thank you for your question. Um, CJC, the Justice Center for decades has had problems. There's nothing new. But we have made some tremendous gains. Um, we haven't seen it in the news as much. Uh, we have dealt with areas where it was lacking. Uh, I had mentioned some time ago we were losing people because of suicide that hadn't been pronounced as suicidal, right? We have made changes in that. We now have the state coming in dealing with mental health issues for some of the worst 
uh, detainees that have that. Um, we have done tremendous work with the medical issues. And it doesn't seem like that long ago, but I don't think you've heard of anyone having that kind of issue within the last two months, three months, in CJC. My fingers crossed. Thanks to Mayor Jones, we now have the health department involved with medical in the Justice Center. We have a medical doctor there that oversees the care that the detainees get. So we are making efforts to improve the justice of uh, drug issues. You mentioned the drug issue, which is right. Drugs can come in whenever there's interaction with the person in the detainment. So whether it's a third party vendor, whether it's a staff member, whether it's uh, visitors, whether it's attorneys, but we are taking steps for them. We are taking steps so that we can determine who may be bringing things in. Now, we have not had an issue in a while, but it doesn't mean that our job is done. It's going to take a lot of work. It's taken a lot of work over the decades. It's going to take us more work to continue doing what we're doing. Uh, the justice system has improved, and we work on it every day to make sure those improvements. But we bring dogs in. We have uh, areas where we kind of check on sales to make sure they're not there. So we recognize the problems, and we've been dealing directly with those problems. So. Thank you so much, Director Coyle. Lakeisha, will you wait for me, please? Lakeisha will be the end of our line this evening, so we'll move to the next person. Good evening, Mayor uh, and Sarah. I am, uh, my name is Margaret Williams, and I'm in the Department of Marvelous Place Community. And while there are many things that we are working on, there are three that have been mentioned tonight that are of uh, great concern to me personally, and I think maybe to others as well. First of all, dealing with the rescue funds, um, I got excited, like the mayor mentioned earlier, that the potential of North St. Louis being improved, the small businesses having an opportunity that they ordinarily would not have. Uh, it's extremely exciting, also, because we, as a family, are small business people. Uh, and with that came up also a lot of this reflection. Because while this has been talked about for a very long time now, uh, back, I think, almost a year and a half when we came to our meeting, um, no money has been done. Even uh, our neighborhood organization that has been given some responsibilities have been told that they have a certain amount of money. And then they said, no, you're only going to get one third. I think that has been changed. However, no funds. Um, people actually started as a community to work that goes along with the application with no funds from the city. Absolutely none. The process with small businesses has been discouraging. We know a lot of small businesses, because they became discouraged, stopped the process. Um, and some have said, uh -huh, so you told you you shouldn't have wasted your time because there's nothing that has been uh, put out into the community. And then the small business people have been told, we're going to allocate to you a certain amount of money when we think you need it. And it's, it's just it's a very cumbersome, difficult to understand process. Now, we're hanging in there mostly, I'll be honest with you, because I believe you, Sarah. I believe that you really know your heart. I don't know that you know all the processes. I don't know if they share everything with you, but it's been very difficult. So that's the first thing, if somebody can address that. Second, ladies, the police recently, and this I understand about the um, working, um, the, the people I have, uh, some of my former students and others in my community actually are police officers. My Sunday school teacher is, well, is a retired police officer. However, when you call the police, and tell them the man is shooting at a lady in front of my house. And uh, the neighbors come out and they stop him for a while and shoot at her again. And then we call the police over and over again. And they come half an hour later. Everybody, nobody's on the street now. Luckily, she did not get hit. She hid behind cars. And people were afraid that their cars were going to be damaged. And happily, they did not get damaged. But the, it took a neighbor talking this man out of two feet. 
people from killing her. The neighbor is not a professional. So if they can be addressed, this timing thing is horrible for us. I don't know what it is for the rest of the city. And then lastly, building and forestry. Two years, two years, two years of common forestry. Two years. One's the LRA home, one's the vacant property on home. No response. Our neighborhood facility person may have gotten in trouble because he got out and cut the weeds down that were taller than the, than the abandoned car that was on the street. Those are real problems for us here in St. Louis. So, uh, Jeremy, would you like to answer the question about the small business process? Ma'am, thank you for your question. Uh, Jared Boyd, Chief of Staff, I, I do do some work with some of our development agencies. And with respect to the corridor grant program and a lot of our grant programs, while the mayor talks about these large figures for relief, it's a corridor grant program, let's say there's $30 million. Whenever we do a program like that, we get $400 million worth of applications. Same thing with some of our large CBA funds. And with the corridor grant program, there's 700 businesses that apply. Not all of them had the correct information. And our departments had to do about 500 interviews with programs. So we hear you. Uh, it has been a long process. This is something that is new. Uh, there is a lot of demand and a lot of need for small business assistance. And $30 million sounds like a lot of money, but when you have $400 million worth of applications, 700 people who are applying, those resources are scarce, and we have to uh, dot our eyes across our teeth. So I hear you, it has taken a long time, but uh, the awards will be announced uh, next month. Uh, so please bear with us as, like I said, we, we get this money out. Uh, we do not want to send money back to the federal government. So ensuring that this money is spent uh, appropriately, but it just goes to show that you know, businesses that have been denied capital, have been denied loans, have been denied access to money, there's still a great need, even though uh, these ARPA funds are starting to address that issue. So hopefully, like, not hopefully, but announcements will be made in May, and uh, if there are other ways that we can support the business, we will. There, are, I, saw, I saw a neighborhood manager here tonight, it's Curtis here. If there are any other, oh, we've got another neighborhood manager. SLDC has neighborhood managers would uh, definitely ask that you get with one of our neighborhood managers to talk about other resources that are available for your small business. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, good evening, Mayor. Good evening, my beautiful people of St. Louis. Lovely, lovely to see you all. Mayor, Travis Wolf, Ellie Bentley, Kylie King, these all have been people that have been affected because you do not have that bad law enforcement. You do not, and the hypocritical responses from law enforcement about the gun control, come on, we know criminals of all the laws. And mayor, let's be honest, every diversity mayor like you, like the one in New York, Chicago, LA, have destroyed the cities that you need. Look, unemployment is rising. St. Louis has shootings almost, uh, almost every single time. What's your question? I'm going to do my question, it's not allowed me to finish, my time is still up. So, people are leaving. Shootings happening almost every single day. The law enforcement is not getting the support they need. I am, a, you know, I, I am part of the National Guard, and so I have been known to protect the greatest country on earth, but yet we have people like you that are hypocrites, and then they are criminalized. Hey, you know what, I'm gonna cut you off now, because you're not gonna stand in my community and call me a hypocrite. You're not well, gonna, you're no, no, uh, excuse me, excuse me. Why excuse me. To be taken away excuse from me. You? No. No. Answer, answer the question. I'm, what are I, you going to do to make the city safer? Because you're definitely not back in law I'm already at work. Ask any of the law enforcement here if I if I hey, back law I enforcement. Ask any of the law enforcement here if I back law enforcement, and they will tell you yes. They got the biggest raise in 20 years under my administration. We hired a world-class chief from outside to come to St. Louis. 
the first chief hired from outside of our city in our entire city's history. So public safety is important to me. Our homicides have gone down 40 percent since I since I became mayor in 2021. We are safer. We have a we've come a long way and we have a long way to go. But you're not going to come in my community and call me a hypocrite. I'm not going to have it. We can have a dialogue and we can be respectful, but I'm not going to have it. You can excuse yourself. You can excuse yourself. No. Next. Next, next question. Next, next question. Thank you. Yeah, Hello, everybody. My name is Timothy Kelly Georgia. Wait, let's let's okay. let's wait for a second. I'm sorry, y'all. My inner north side came out. <laughs> of boards and commissions that are looking for volunteers uh, because a lot of our decisions are made by boards and commissions and they have wonderful volunteer citizens who serve there. Um, you can also look on our website to see if there are any jobs open you might be interested in. Um, and if not with uh, St. Louis, with city government, also uh, SLDC and our other partner organizations. Um, and just stay in touch. We would love to keep in touch with you about how to engage. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Precious Jones. Um, I lost my son, Preston Jones. He was 20 to gun violence in June 17th of 2022. So, um, my concern is the narrative being pushed off that like our violence and homicides are going down tremendously. I don't see that. And I think that having town hall meetings is okay. But I think that you all need to actually get out into the community. It's the difference between being in the community with boots on the ground outside of these neighborhoods versus coming to buildings like this and talking to us because I've been to so many meetings. Um, my second thing is when I visited Chicago, I was really shocked by how they had police, like two police cruisers on each corner of their high violent areas. And it was way more peaceful. I think that that's something that you all should maybe think about doing because, like, obviously, I was caught in the crossfire the other night bringing my grandkids in the house. Had nothing to do with me. I literally had to almost roll into the car because two, three cars came flying down the street shooting at each other. I could have been dead. So it's, it's a lot of work that needs to be done. So I think that I just don't like the narrative. It's like, oh, we're, you know, it's. It's low, the front is it's not. It's a lot of crime, it's a lot of shootings that happen that's not being reported. So I think that I challenge everybody up from this panel to actually get outside in the communities, walk these neighborhoods, talk to the people in these neighborhoods, see what we need. Come into these meetings, I get the same thing. We'll talk to you, we'll connect with you. I might have a lead or two with the person that take my information, and then after that, it's nothing. So 
go outside into the communities and how we, I mean, how we will benefit. Uh, my condolences for your loss. Um, I have also lost, since I've become mayor, I've lost four relatives to gun violence. Uh, one in Chicago and three here. And uh, nothing can replace, nothing can replace the holes that you feel when they're gone. Um, and I hear you when you say you don't feel like crime is low. It's, it's, it's lower, but it's not low. And we have, we have come a long way, but we have so much more work to do. And we won't get there overnight. Uh, some of the things that are tying our hands is the gun laws in the state of Missouri. We have some of the most lax gun laws in the country. The NRA doesn't even play here anymore because they don't feel like they have any work to do, that, that the Missouri legislature has relaxed gun laws to the point where they don't even feel like they need to be here anymore. And relax gun laws not only keep us in danger, but also our law enforcement and our first responders. So while we can't address that, we did start an Office of Violence Prevention in 2022 um, and have fully funded that in this year's budget. But that work also takes time. We took that work from um, Newark, New Jersey, for example, as the same size population as St. Louis. Their Office of Violence Prevention has been there for 10 years. And in 10 years, they have reduced the number of homicides per year to around 50. So we're right at about 150, 160 now. Or as of 2020, as of, as of the end of 2023, we have a long way to go, but it requires all of us working together, and it's a it's a it's a divide and conquer strategy. Basically, we have to um, we have to use prevention, intervention, and enforcement. So we start with prevention with the Office of Violence Prevention and trusted messengers and the organizations that they fund, and also with intervention. Uh, again, with the Office of Violence Prevention. And if those two things don't work, then we get to enforcement. And we also have a good circuit attorney who will now keep people in jail who, who were getting out before. They would commit crimes and they could get out and they would still wreak havoc on our neighborhoods, on your neighborhood, on my neighborhood, which is I'm just across page. So I hear it too. It wakes me up in the middle of the night. So I feel you. I feel you. And just know that we are hard at work every day. Uh, we won't get there overnight, but we will get there. We will get there. Thank you so much for your question. Two more questions. You need Mary, everybody. Ah, let's see. First question. Who are you? What's your name, sir? I'm fine, Mary. I'm a McCallum. We all know McCallum, as a matter of fact. And what I was trying to do is kind of pull in the this microphone, hands on is a dangerous weapon. But I'm going to keep it straight. Keep it straight. <laughs> um, illegal dumping is one of the things that came up uh, in our neighborhood, so I didn't want to be talking about it. And then I'm an 8565, I don't care what I'm talking about, 8565 uh, I had an app sitting there for about two months so far, nobody's picked it up. So I don't know if you got somebody who talked to me about that. Very happy to see the refuge workers are here and that the Sergeant Gray confirmed with me that they are essential workers. So our refuge department will be more than work and they probably need more people to help them. So probably somebody could get that back on the side of my house. You know, you almost think I'm having a real, real problem, but you all addressed a lot of questions that you all asked before me. Really addressed a lot of things that I was concerned about, man, so I didn't really have very much to say. But I do know uh, that the refuge workers, workers had some concerns. Uh, but your director of operations, Nancy Cross, has agreed to talk with them. So everything's happening. Keep up your work. You got all the Thank you. Thank you so much. Final question of the evening. Thank you. My name is Lawrence Wachu. Uh, that's my uh, super engineer. Uh, we are up here on Lindo. Mayor, uh, I just wanted to say that you are doing a great job. And I want you to continue uh, in our support. Uh, now, on the other hand, um, you are staffs. Since I've been engineering, I have to ask engineering question. 
the fact that the uh, staff are able to debunk, debunk some of the major projects and make it accessible to companies of my size, of you know, smaller businesses, and that's a great way to bring equity and inclusion that we seek. But there are also some other agencies within the may not be working for the city government but, or to the city government, but they are here still with tax dollars that do not do what you are asking, uh, what you are implementing, because what they are implementing works perfect. But what they are doing is having everything in the long term, and those of us that have internships, we have interns from Sloan, from uh, neighborhood areas, and also interns that are even high school kids that just need to finish class. We provide them with training, and when I have a lab, as well as a medical office. So, providing those type of relationship and nurturing and growing these kids, uh, we do all of that. But it appears that um, we are not getting too much out of it, except your people, because your administration is excellent. They know how to bundle these jobs. But many other agencies that collect tax money that are here do not do that. And that even the ones that you worked for for a long time do not do that. And that's a concern that we have. We just need a support in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, that was our last question. That was our last question. I'm sorry. Um, we are going to, there is a resource fair upstairs that has all of, or several city departments, and we invite you to join us upstairs. Again, we thank you all for coming. Have a great evening, and God bless.